You're listening to the Victor Youth Podcast. Well, um, I want to say welcome to every single person that is here at Victory Youth. Um, I do believe that regardless of whether or not we're recording this or we're not recording this, um, that what we're about to do um, is, is, is we're going to be talking about Scripture. We're going to be talking about the Word of God, uh, the mandate on our lives as Christians. Um, and I think that that is going to touch some people. Um, I firmly believe um, that people either in this physical room with us or listening on the podcast um, are going to come into a realization, and this is a bold statement, that they are called to be missionaries. I truly believe that tonight, or wherever you're listening to this, whenever you're listening to this, um, there is people that are going to come into a shocking realization that, oh my gosh, the, the, the call on my life and the destiny on my life is to go do missions. I really do believe that. Um, and so before I jump into anything, um, this is going to be the structure um, of, the, of these podcasts. Um, is I'm going I'm to sit here um, on a Wednesday night at Victory Church in Edmond, um, and I'm going to talk to the youth students that I get the privilege of pastoring. Um, and if you are listening um, on a podcast, I'm so glad that you tuned in. I'm so glad that you're listening, and I believe that God um, chose and anointed um, you to be here as well. Um, before I dive into anything serious, um, I would like to tell a story. You guys cool with that? Yeah? Okay. So um, here is um, what I'd like to talk about. Um, my brother, um, he's actually in the room here right now. I talk about him most every week because he did a lot of stupid stuff when he was younger. Um, so I have a lot of stories. Uh, my brother, um, his name is Lucas. He's a great guy. Um, and he went through an experience uh, that maybe you guys have gone to before. If you've ever gone to church camp, whether you've gone to church camp with us or gone to church camp with someone else, um, you've probably experienced this thing that we call a camp high. You guys ever experienced this before? A camp high. What is a camp high, Will? I'll tell you. Um, A camp high is when you go to camp, get super on fire for Jesus, dedicate your life to the Lord. Um, You come home and that fire lasts for like maybe four days um, and then it starts dwindling down. You guys experienced this before? So so the story that I'm about to tell you... um, it was right after my amazing brother. I went to church camp, um, got lit on fire for the Lord. Um, got lit for the Lord. <laughs> um, I didn't say that. Um, but he, he, got, he, he was super um, passionate about Jesus. Um, and in that moment, he was so sold out that he was like, Will, I'm going to go to work with you. Um, at this time, I was not a pastor. Um, I was a janitor. Um, maybe you didn't know that. Um, I was a janitor for years here at Victory. Um, I scrubbed toilets. Um, I cleaned bathrooms. Um, I actually got fired from doing that because I was so bad at cleaning those things, um, which is a sad truth, but it is true. Um, I had got demoted um, to lawn mower. Okay. Does anyone like mowing the lawn? I'm super surprised right now if you like mowing the lawn. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, so I was a lawn mower guy. Um, so Lucas came up um, and he said he was going to help me. He was going to help me mow the lawn. Um, here's the thing. He was probably, this wasn't that, this was maybe two or two and a half years ago. Um, if you've ever met my brother, um, you wouldn't trust him with a lawnmower. It's not because he's irresponsible or anything like that. It's just he likes to have fun, and he would probably end up severely injuring himself. Um, I didn't trust him with a weed whacker, obviously, because um, that's double the intensity. Um, there was one job that was safe, that was easy, that was not difficult to do, um, and it was doing something called a Roundup. Has anyone ever heard of Roundup before? Roundup is, is weed killer, okay? It kills weeds. Um, and obviously, you could hurt yourself if you, like, drank it or something. But unless you do that, you're good. You get on your foot, wipe it off. doesn't matter. Um, and so we, he was going to round up. It was going to be chill. It was going to be easy. And so here's the instructions I gave to him. I looked at him in the eye. He's just so on fire to serve the kingdom of God and help me mow. Um, and I was like, here's your job. Where the asphalt meets the curb, there's a bunch of weeds, does that make sense? You know what I mean? You've seen that before? Where the asphalt meets the curb, there's always these weeds that sprout up. Um, so I told him, okay, Luke, your job is to spray all of these weeds with the Roundup and kill it. You following? You guys following me? Yeah, okay. So, so, so that's his job. It was very clear. It was very precise. Kill the weeds with the Roundup. Really straightforward stuff here, Okay. Here's the thing about Roundup. It doesn't kill immediately. It's not like acid. It's not like it hits the weed and the weed dies. It takes a few hours, maybe a day or two, okay? Um, And so I couldn't really know how well of a job he did until I came back a few days later. Um, And the crazy part was, 
I drove into the parking lot, maybe two or three days later, um, and I noticed something very peculiar. Um, all of the weeds were still there. And I was thinking, like, what did he do for two hours? Did he just, like, sit around? Um, and he, and I, he's like, no, I, I, I swear I was spraying the weeds, and um, I don't know. And so I'm walking around. None of the weeds are dead. Every single one of them is alive um, until I went behind the building that we are currently sitting in to see that he had misinterpreted my instructions and sprayed every single thing he thought was a weed on the field of grass and literally killed at least 70% of our grass because he had spent probably, probably two hours straight pumping up and spraying life killer all over our grass, okay? I know, it was great, it was hilarious. He never got to do that job again. He was, he was hedge clipping next time, it was great. Um, it's just kidding. We wouldn't let him hedge clip. Um, but no, so um, he, he, he really messed it up, guys. Um, he, he did this whole roundup thing. He, I was very, very clear with my instruction. Um, and although he wasn't intending to disobey me, he really, all he heard was kill the weeds, right? All he heard was kill the weeds. And so he went and did something that he was not supposed to do in an effort to try to accomplish the original goal. And at the end of the day, he didn't really do anything that I had asked him. Does that make sense? And so here's my fear. My biggest fear as a pastor is that I would lead you guys through your teenage years, through middle school, through high school. And I would have you thinking you're doing what you're supposed to do as a Christian. I would have you thinking that you are accomplishing the goal and the task that is on your life as a Jesus follower. Just for at the end of your life for you to realize, oh my gosh, I didn't even do what I was asked. The worst thing I can think of is students that have come through this ministry, going through their lives and one day meeting Jesus and him saying, I love you, but you didn't actually do any of the things that I commanded you to do. And so tonight we're talking um, about this, this task that Jesus has given us. And I have this, this mindset on my head that we should listen to it in the same way that my brother should have been listening to me when I instructed him on the roundup. What we're about to talk about is the instructions that Jesus has for our lives, the task that he wants us to accomplish, the action that he wants us to take. And that action is known as the Great Commission. Some will say Great Commission. What is the Great Commission? Well, let, let me first, if you don't know what it is, um, let, let, me, let me put you at ease. Whether you're in here or you're listening on the podcast, if you don't know what the Great Commission is, there is 51% of Christians that say they don't know what it is, that they've never heard of it. 51% of Christians have never heard of it. 6% of Christians are not even sure if they've heard of it. And 25% of Christians say that they've heard of it, but they couldn't tell you what it was. We're talking about 82% of Jesus followers that are unaware of what our mission is. 82% of people that, that, are, that are following Jesus have, have no idea or, or can't fully tell you what our task is. And that's not me condemning because I didn't know what it was for a while either. It, I want this to be a wake-up call. And so what we're talking about tonight, this, this great commission it's something that I don't want us to take lightly. I don't want us to take it as just some teaching because I truly believe that this is the mandate on our lives, all of us. And so let me just read it to you first and then we'll talk about it. It's in Matthew 16 through 20. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. So Jesus just came to him and said, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is the part I want you to catch. The commandment, the task. Therefore, go. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore go 
and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you, Jesus speaking. And surely I am with you to the very end of the age. That's the Great Commission. That's our task. That's the instruction. Therefore, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. Well, here's kind of um, the thought process that I went through when I first read this and honestly sort of where most of the global church um, struggles with this. Um, They they have two main questions. Um, The first one is, is that really for us today? Like that was written 2,000 years ago, right? It was written 2,000 years ago. Is it relevant to us today? And people always wonder, is that for everyone? Like if everyone went into the nations, then no one would be here, right? If every single person went to go be crazy missionary people, then we'd have no one here, right? This is sort of the questions or the thought space that that most people find themselves struggling with. Um, And I know that I do um, when I think about the Great Commission, but... Here's some things that I want to talk about um, that I think will really bring some clarity to this. Um, and I just think it's so, so important. Um, so, so that first one, is the Great Commission for today? Is the Great Commission for today in, in 2020 here? Um, or was it just in year like AD 60, whenever this was written or something like that? And um, well, here's what, I would, here's what I would offer up. Have we made disciples of all nations? So we're talking about whether or not this is still relevant to us. I would ask you this. Have we accomplished this? Have we made disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey? Have we done it? And honestly, I wasn't sure going into studying this um, originally about a year ago. Had we? Have you ever thought about that? Is there Christians all over the world? I feel like I've heard stories about these crazy, obscure, tiny little tribes in Africa that maybe haven't heard about Jesus, but pretty much everyone, right? Pretty much all nations, pretty much everyone all over the earth, um, in Asia and in Europe and in Australia, like in my head, I had thought like, yeah, they probably have missionaries there at least, right? They've probably heard about Jesus. Well, here's some shocking statistics. And most of these are derived um, from the Joshua Project. So if you don't believe me, I would encourage you, please go um, look at joshuaproject.net and and research these for yourself. Um, There is roughly, and I say roughly because people disagree, roughly 195 countries on the earth. Someone say 195. Approximately, which is really funny because the U.S. disagrees with everyone else, but approximately 195, 200-ish countries on the planet. Okay? Out of those 195 Every single one of them has missionaries there. Every single one of them has some sort of church in that country, right? That's awesome. That was exciting to me. I was like, oh, so we've accomplished it, right? Like we've gone to all the nation. We've gone to every country. All 195 have missionaries there. But here's what I didn't know. The Bible was not written in English. This passage specifically was written in Greek in the New Testament. And this word that it uses for nation doesn't directly translate. And so the word in in Greek that was used for nation is the word ethne. Someone say ethne. It's where we get our word ethnic from. It means an ethnic group, a people group. Not a a political country. They didn't have those as organized back then, but an ethnic group, a group of people. So let let me explain like this. Um, How many of you guys have ever heard of Nigeria? It's a country, okay? Nigeria is one country, and within that one country there is 540 people groups. There is 540 groups of people that are separated by either language or religion or status or culture or a mix of all of them. So if, if even though there might be churches in Nigeria, there is 540 different mission fields to tackle. Does that make sense? And so, so let's explain like this. Even though there's only 195 countries on the planet, there is 17,000 unique people groups that exist. 17,000 people groups. That's crazy to me. And out of those 17,000 people groups that exist, or nations, there is 7,000, someone say 7,000, that are considered unreached by the gospel. 
What does that word unreached mean? Because I've heard it my whole life um, in church, but I had no idea what it meant. It means there's no Christians there? Well, here's, here's what um, most missionary organizations identify as unreached. If an area has less than 2% of the population following Jesus, and less than 5% claiming to be Christians, they're considered an unreached people. Does that make sense? So we're talking about 7,000 people groups, nations in the world, some of those having tens of millions of people in it that have less than 2% of people trying to spread the gospel, less than 5% of people claiming to be Christians. And out of that 7,000, some will say 3,000, there is uh, debatably, and I, and I will say debatably, a lot of these statistics um, are disputed because they keep updating. Um, debatably, around 3,000 people groups. So I'm not talking people. I'm talking people groups. Groups that some of which are, like I said, are in the millions size-wise. 3,000 of those groups are considered completely cut off from the gospel. There is, in 3,000 of those groups, there is no known churches, missionaries, or Christians in the entire nation. And again, maybe God's working in some crazy supernatural way, and we don't know um, exactly what's happening there, and that's awesome, and and I hope that Jesus is doing that. But we're looking at approximately 42% of the population of the earth living in an unreached area. People have estimated that we are potentially having somewhere around, and again, disputed, somewhere around 2 billion people that haven't even had the opportunity to give their lives to Jesus because they're not at a knowledge base to understand it. This broke my heart. So when I look at the Great Commission and I say, is that for us today? I say, did we accomplish it? And the answer is no. And that isn't so we get mad at ourselves, but it's so that we can wake up and go and do something about it. It's what Jesus is asking of us. And that sort of leads into that next question that a lot of people have is, is the Great Commission, is this call in our lives to go reach the unreached, to go make disciples of all nations, baptize them and teach them to obey? Is that for every single person? Or is it just for like a theoretical group? Is that just something that the church as a whole should accomplish? Or is it something that you're responsible for? Is it a task on your life? Well, here is what I would say. We can get into this misconception, um, particularly in the U.S., um, and I think just um, it's, it's not a bad thing, it's not bad-hearted, but the tendency that we have um, is to so closely associate church, someone say church, with a building or an organization because when Jesus talked to the church, he wasn't talking to some organization or, or business or specific group that, that, that gathered in a building. He was talking to people. The church is those that follow Jesus. And so if the church, the capital C church, if us as believers, we are the church, are to be tasked with something, the only way that that gets accomplished is by individuals doing it. You know what I mean? We can't say, is the church at large just supposed to accomplish this or am I supposed to accomplish it? Because the church at large is made up of us. We are supposed to accomplish it. And yes, there are certain people that are called right here to Oklahoma. I believe that I am in this time to pastor here, to do stuff here. There's people that are called to just give financially to, to reaching the unreached. There's people that are called to sell everything and move to the middle of nowhere, third world country where Christianity is illegal to go tell them about the love of God. I'm not saying every single person is supposed to literally move there, but I do believe every single individual is supposed to participate in going. Whether they're going there physically, whether they're supporting people that go there physically, whether they're just praying about it. But here's what we need to do. We need to not do this thing. And honestly, something that I've done for most of my Christian walk um, is say, well, that's not really my calling. You know, like it's not really me to be a missionary. I'll just pray. But the thing is, I never actually pray. You know, I never actually prayed for that. I would always say, yes, well, like I'll just support them in prayer. But I never actually did it. I would just say, well, maybe I'm just called to give, but I never actually gave. I believe that all of us in some way are are supposed to, to, to give toward some, whether that's energy, whether that's time, whether that's prayers, whether that's us physically, give toward the accomplishing of the Great Commission. 
I think about what would happen if the church actually became dedicated to finishing the task. Because we could do it. We have the manpower to do it. But here's something that was very alarming to me. Out of, in the world, out of the money that's spent on Christian ministry, out of the money that's spent doing things for the Lord, amazing things for the Lord, that I'm so glad that we're doing, less than a penny of every dollar goes towards reaching unreached people groups, goes towards finishing the task that's on, on our lives. I think that the, the lack of acknowledgement or drive or passion for the Great Commission is one of the greatest hindrances of the enemy. Because if he can convince us that, well, everyone knows about Jesus, that is a perfect way to manipulate us not to evangelize. But let, let, let's break this down a little bit more. So, so we know that the Great Commission is for us in some way. We know the Great Commission is for today because honestly, we're just, we're not that far into accomplishing it. We're over halfway. But what actually is it? So we broke it out down into three parts um, and, and I believe the way that, that the scripture goes, therefore go, someone say therefore go, make disciples, baptize, teach to obey. Make disciples, baptize, Teach to obey. Those are the three things. We're supposed to go and do those three things. And I, and I believe that we need to um, understand those things and actually what that looks like because I can say all day, go disciple people. But if you have no idea what that means, then I haven't actually accomplished very much. You know what I mean? And so, so sort of here's, um, here's, here's what I want to talk about. The word disciple. Let's talk about make disciples. We're supposed to go make disciples of all nations. The word in the Bible that's used for make disciples, I'm going to butcher it, so I'm going to try to pronounce it, um, is mathetes. Someone say mathetes. I pro we probably just horrendously butcher that word. Um, it, it's the word that, that we translate to mean disciple. In scripture, it means learner or pupil. That word pupil is so funny. We don't say it anymore. We should, we should start calling people our pupils instead of our disciples. No, you're not with me? Not funny? It's okay. We'll move on. Um, <laughs> it means learner or pupil. Um, here's, here's sort of this mindset I want to get in. You may have prayed a prayer before to accept Jesus into your heart, and I love that. I think that's incredible. I think that's amazing. I don't decide who's saved and who's not saved, so I would never ever tell you, um, you prayed a prayer, but you didn't really mean it, or you did really mean it, because I don't know, because I'm not God. And so, but here's something I would challenge you guys with, um, and I want you to honestly reflect on this. Are you actually a disciple? Something I've been thinking about. I'm not saying, uh, ha have you said a prayer once and committed your life to Jesus? I'm saying, are you actually a disciple? Are you actually committed to learning? Are you actually a, a pupil? And I think if we can sort of start processing through this, we, some of us will realize, oh my gosh, no, like I'm not. And I think we need to take that super, super seriously. Because if we aren't being discipled or we haven't been discipled, I don't believe that we can effectively go and disciple other people of all nations. It's, it's a big deal, it's a serious thing. And if any of you are thinking this lie that you are too young, I want to bring something up real quick um, because it's really, really, really heavy on my heart. Most theologians believe that some of the disciples were as young as 12 or 13 when they got called by Jesus originally. Raise your hand if you're 12 or 13. Tons of you, okay? You put your hands down. 12 or 13, get, get this image in your head. The disciples, a few of the disciples were likely your age, when they were called. And because they, they did ministry with Jesus for about three years and were just discipled and followed him around, that puts them at 15 or 16 when they were leading churches. That puts them at 15 or 16 when they were making other disciples, when they were doing crazy stuff for Jesus. So that whole lie that you may be experiencing that I know that I did and that I still do, of you're just too young. You can't, no one will follow you. 
You can't disciple. I want to tell you right now that that is a lie. That's not true. I believe that you have so much power in you, whether you're 12 or 22. I believe that Jesus is calling you. And I believe that you have um, a purpose that surpasses what you think you might be capable of. It's crazy when we think about the fact um, that, that pretty much everyone agrees that the majority of the disciples were teenagers. Jesus changed the world by hanging out with 12 uh, or 10 to 12 teenagers. And those were the people that were being disciples. Those were the people that were making disciples. You are capable. So make disciples. Someone say make disciples. Baptize. Someone say baptize. It says baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This could be an entire podcast within and of itself. Baptize. I think that we have sort of, sort of come off, um, especially in our culture, of the significance of baptism. I believe um, that baptism is so vastly important more than we, we think it is. Here, here's what I would say. Um, I am fully convinced that not just pastors ought to baptize. I think that if you're discipling someone and you're teaching them to obey and you're actually teaching them and they're, they're being a learner, um, that, that you have full capability, you have full anointing and you have full spiritual power to baptize someone. And I've seen it done and it's beautiful. I've seen, I've seen 17 year olds baptize 13 year olds. It's amazing. What is baptism? Well, let me tell you this. A lot of you maybe haven't understood the magnitude of it, or you've maybe seen baptisms in a church service before where someone goes underwater, they come back up, and everyone cheers, and it's really exciting. Um, or maybe you do follow Jesus, and you just never really got around to it. Um, I am not by any means saying that baptism is necessary to have a relationship with Jesus. But here's what I am saying. I, I, I do believe that the early church, the disciples, the apostles, would not have considered you a part of the body if you hadn't gone through that step. Not saying that that's what saves you, not saying that that's what takes your sins away, but here's what I am saying. That baptism functions as three things. Three things. The first things it does is it connects you to the body of Christ, Acts 2.38. It connects you to the body of Christ. It says, hey, I'm a part of the church. The second thing it does is that it shows that you're committed to the movement of God, 1 Corinthians 12.13. It shows, hey, I'm a Christian. I'm gonna run after this thing. I'm gonna evangelize. I'm gonna actually follow Jesus. And lastly, it shows that you are cleansed of your sins. Acts 22, 18. It shows that you're clean. Baptism is so ridiculously important because it shows the commitment. It's sort of like an initiation ceremony. It's what, it's what shows that you're a part of this thing. And again, I'm not saying, don't hear me wrong, you're not Christian, you're not holy, you're not good if you haven't been baptized. What I am saying is if I was you, I would get baptized as quickly as humanly possible if you're following Jesus. I would say that, that, that taking that step um, is, is not um, or should not be an option. It should not be this mindset that we have sometimes where we think, well, do I need to to go to heaven? If you're ever asking, do I need to, go, need to, to go to heaven? I would check your heart. Um, because I think that that's the wrong question. I think that if Jesus commands us to do something, we should chase that with passion and with fire, right? We don't wanna go about things with a, well, do I really have to tell my friends about Jesus? Do I really have to get baptized? Like, will I still go to heaven? And I think that sort of reveals some issues that reveals some heart things. So, so we, we ought to make disciples. Someone say make disciples. We ought to baptize them. Someone say baptize them. And the last part, the really not fun part of that is we need to teach them to obey. Teach them to obey. Obedience is the love language of God. Obedience is how we show God that we love him. And here's what I would say. And this is, uh, this is a little bit deep. And, I, and again, I really don't want you to misinterpret this. Obedience is a part of salvation. It's not the part of salvation that saves you. It's not the part of salvation that wipes your sins away. That's faith alone. It's only believing in Jesus that that gets you into a personal relationship with Jesus. That saves you from your sin. But obedience, or maybe I'd say it like this, obedience is a necessary part of being a Jesus follower. 
Because there's a big difference between having your sins justified from accepting the grace of God. I mean, we know that. Ephesians 2, 8. We're saved by grace through faith. Only faith gets, does our saving. But for us to be Christians, for us to actually try to be Christ-like, for us to be followers of Jesus, that takes obedience. And it's that same thing that I said before. If you say, do I need to be obedient to go to heaven? I think it's the wrong question. What if we were so passionate about obe being obedient to the Lord because we knew how much it meant to him? So we ought to make disciples. We had to baptize them and to teach them to obey all that Jesus has commanded us. Here's the last um, little, little few things that I wanna talk about um, because I think that this part um, is something that I truly believe God wants to communicate to you, whether you're here with me live or you're listening to this weeks and weeks later. I believe that there's people that can hear me right now that are called to be missionaries, that are called to go. And there's so much of a fear involved that they won't let that calling come up in them. And that's not for me to pressure you. That's not for me to trick anyone. I want you to go where God wants you to go. But here, here's, here's what I would say. I, if we don't talk about practically what going looks like, then we're gonna be in trouble. So what is going look like? Therefore go is what Jesus commands us. What does it mean to go? Well, on a local level, I would say this. Let us not become so focused on reaching the nations that we forget to reach our neighbor. Let us not be so excited about reaching the unreached and, get, and donating to this and doing all this stuff um, that we, we, we ignore the fact that our next door neighbor, our friend at school is just as broken and is just as far from God as anyone in some foreign country somewhere is. I would say that you've probably experienced before, even though we're technically a reached area, sometimes you probably feel like there's less than 2% of people following Jesus around you. Maybe America's reached, but maybe your friend group isn't. I think we should take seriously the fact that 87% that of households in America have a Bible in it, but only about 23% of people in general, including teenagers and adults, have read more than a few sentences in their life. We might be reached in America, as in there might be a high percentage of people claiming Jesus or understanding the gospel, um, but I would say that there is parts and there is corners of your school, of our city, that is so deeply broken that needs to be reached, that needs someone to go into it. I believe that we are vessels. I believe that God had you be born in the city that you were born in, living in the city you're currently living in, listening to this podcast for a reason. The people you know, the people you do life with, that is a unique opportunity. That's a role that you're filling. So I believe that we need to use it. We need to do less spectating of what God's doing in the church and more doing. I think it's great to bring your friends to church. I would love for you to bring your friends here. But if we can't equip our students to present the gospel outside of the doors... I don't feel like convincing you guys to bring them in so that I can present the gospel for you is really training you up in the faith. Does it make sense? And so we, we, we need to do this. We need to get passionate. We need to start be praying radically and doing all this crazy stuff that you'd probably do on a mission trip, but just feels kind of uncomfortable here in OKC. With that being said, here's the last part. Um, and here's where I, I'm, I'm sort of feeling um, just a large pull from the Holy Spirit. I think that, and, I, and I've said this already, but I think that there might be people in here that sort of have a draw emotionally to missions, to actually going into the world, into the nations. But there's so much fear involved that honestly, you're just really not willing to give everything up. Like to be, to be transparent. There's people in here, um, and, and I know there's been times in my life where the idea that you'd be called to, to leave isn't really even something you would let God tell you to do. 
because it scares you too much, because it scared me too much. And I, and I, I want to read this scripture because I believe it's so relevant for where we're at. Matthew 9, 35 through 38. It says, and Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without shepherds. Then he said to his disciples, and what I believe he is speaking to us tonight, the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few. The harvest is plentiful, the workers are few. I believe that there is places in the world that you are being called to go bring the light of Jesus to. And I I truly do believe that something inside of you is lighting up right now. And that you can feel that and it scares you. And that's okay. Okay. But here's what I encourage you to do. If you're in here and you're thinking, Will, that's not me. It's okay. I believe all of us are called to this great commission, but you're saying, I'm not gonna go give up everything. I'm called here. I'm supposed to be here. Let's actually like do something here then. There, there's a website. If you go to finishthetask.com, there is lists of 230 people groups that are completely cut off from the gospel. No known Christians there. You can go and read the name of it. You can read where it's at. You can read the culture and you can intentionally pray for that group of people. What would happen if all of us gathered around praying for these people that had no Christians, that had no light of Jesus through, through, through Jesus followers there? Or um, I, I was even looking into, you can go to a website that is um, W, or sorry, Y-W-A-M-F-M.com, Y-W-A-M-F-M.com, um, and it is an entire group of people that's entire mission, its entire organization is sending missionaries into areas where there's no missionaries. And I don't care if you're donating 10 cents I believe we're all supposed to participate in this. And the last thing that I want to talk about is this phrase that is said right before therefore go in this phrase that is said directly after the Great Commission. Before therefore go, it says all authority, Jesus says this in scripture, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. He starts it with that. I own everything. Therefore, because I own everything, go. And at the end of it, he says, and surely I am with you to the very end of the age. It's this assurance that he's with us, that he's beside us, so we don't have to have fear. And I know this is a lot, and I know this is heavy, and some of you just are are going through class um, in high school or college or middle school, and you're really honestly not thinking too much about the needs of the world when you can't even pass a math test. And I understand the giant scope of this. And I understand how unfamiliar this might even be to some of you but I believe it's so important and if you are listening to this I do think you're ready and I do think you're mature enough and I do think you're powerful enough to process these things to pray about these things to start giving um, time or energy or money toward this task that we've been given surely I am with you to the very end of the age We hope you enjoyed Pastor Will talking about the Great Commission. Tune in next month for our next episode of the Victory Youth Podcast.